with me as we continue our series in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4. Last week we looked at chapter 3 and we realized that Jesus is greater than Moses. Remember these Jewish Christians were struggling about returning back to the old temple services and the old way of doing things. And the author of the book of Hebrews is reminding them that Jesus is greater than Moses, whom they placed their trust in. We saw how they were struggling about their relationship and, and being tempted to return back to the old temple services. And we read in the Gospels that the Pharisee says, we are disciples of Moses when they were battling against Jesus. And Hebrews tells them, no, Jesus is greater than Moses. And we ask the question for ourselves, what are you placing in the realm? What's your Moses, basically? Are you putting anything before Jesus? Because we should not. The number one thing in our life should be Jesus Christ. And we learned that they did not enter into the rest of Christ. And he gave the example of the people wandering in the wilderness. And we emphasize the fact that if you hear the voice of God today, Today is the day you should surrender. Don't put it off to tomorrow because who you are on Monday may not be the person you are on Thursday. And today, if you still hear his voice, you must surrender to God. But the notion of today continues in Hebrews chapter 4. That's how important it is. And so we open our Bibles there to Hebrews chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. He says, therefore... Let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to come short of it. For indeed, we've had the good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. If you pay attention there, it says, that they, in the Old Testament, have had the good news preached to them. The gospel. You know why? Because the gospel has never changed from Genesis to Revelation. It's always been about the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It's never changed. They've had the good news preached to them. So did the time and the people in Paul's time. And so of us today. And yet. It did not benefit them. They didn't enter the rest of God because of unbelief. They heard the good news. They knew what the gospel was about, but they refused to believe in the gospel. The gospel has been preached to them, to Paul's time, and to us. We are preaching the same gospel they are preaching, except for them, it was on the Messiah to come, for us, it's the Messiah that did come. However, it's always been about accepting the substitutionary atonement of the sacrifice on our behalf. But because of unbelief, true faith hears the gospel, and we then orientate our lives to live out the gospel in us. Right? It's understand, by the way, Hebrews, when we get to Hebrews chapter 11, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. No, that's Romans. So <laughs> Hebrews 11, 1 says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is our faith based on? It's not based on blind beliefs. It's based on the promises of God. Whatever God has promised, we can bank on it. And it's based on these promises that I orientate my life to live my life based on the promises of God. And yet they had that. They had seen the pillar of fire by night and the cloud by day. They had seen the outpouring of the ten plagues on Egypt. They had seen the feeding of the manna. They saw it all and refused to believe in the God who led them out of Egypt. That's how blind sin makes a person. Verse 3. For those who have believed, enter that rest. Just as he said, I swore in my truth, swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. 
Now imagine this with me, right? Just to understand what's happening. God's wrath, by the way, it's another way of saying his judgment after he's exhausted every avenue to try to save you, right? He's trying to save you. He's trying, and so now eventually you will receive the righteous judgment of God. And so he says, I swore they shall not enter my rest. Now picture this with me. You have the combination to unlock the safe of five billion dollars. All you have to do is unlock the safe. You have the combination. And so you are trying the combination because you heard the word safe, and you have the combination, and you're unlocking. And God is saying, it's never going to work because the safe with the $5 billion is over here. And you keep trying here. And that's why he says, you will never enter in my rest because you're trying to do it your way. You're trying to do it by works. You're trying to appease me in a manner that doesn't work. So you can have the right combination. If you're at the wrong God, you'll never find the rest you're looking for. Cain tried to appease God by bringing the best of his fruit. God never asked to bring the best of your fruit. He asked to bring the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So God is now saying, look, I'm going to keep you up. He's saying, look, you can try that combination all you want. It's never going to work. Because the safe with the $5 billion is over here. And yet they continue to knock their heads. Turn, did I turn it three times to the left and one time to the right? And they keep going back and forth. And he's saying, it's over here. And they refuse. It says in verse 3, to continue the verse, it says, For he who has believed entered the rest, just as he has said, As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Mind you, the first half of that verse says, The true believer enters into that rest. But I don't want you to miss the point that chapter 3 made and that he's continuing to make here. There were people who entered into the rest of God even while they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Think about it. They were in the wilderness for 40 years, yet they entered the rest of God. The majority did not, and they died in the wilderness. Why? Because they did not believe in the promises of God. It had nothing to do with the promises. It had nothing to do with the church. The only way we find ultimate rest is to trust God implicitly. Amen. Whether you are in the wilderness or you are in the church, true rest is only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Talks about, though, the end of verse 3 there says, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, and look what he says in verse 4. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Well, let's go back a little history there, a little creation history. The argument is subtle here, so pay attention. He says, God created the heavens and the earth in how many days? Six days. And then what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. So he created in the first six days. Now, was God tired? No, God wasn't tired. He rested from his works, leaving us an example that everything that is made, yourself included, was done by who? By God. All we have to do is trust in his work, both in creation and in redemption. For he said somewhere, Concerning the seventh day. Now, the seventh day Sabbath still stands. It's never been changed. The Ten Commandments stand. It's a transcript of his character. But I don't want you to miss the point that the author is making about the seventh day. Let's continue. 
verse 5, he says, And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter it because of disobedience. For he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. So there remains a seventh day. But he says, wait a minute. It's not about the seventh day. Because you could be a seventh day Adventist and still not find rest in Jesus Christ. See, it was never about the promised land, and it's never about the seventh day. If you don't have Jesus, the seventh day means nothing. And if you don't have God entering to the promised land, meant nothing. It's always been about God. He goes on to say this. Today, he fixes a certain day, today. That today could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever. Whatever day you decide to surrender your life to God, it's the best day of your life. Don't put it off to tomorrow. Don't put it off to the future. That's why he keeps harping in chapter three and in chapter four. Today. And we know that. How many of us has had this happen? Happens to me often, unfortunately. Somebody tells you something. And you know you should do it right there. Because if you put it off, you're going to forget. And oftentimes I say to myself, ah, I'll do it in a little bit. And then my wife is calling me for the third time to take off the garbage. <laughs> take off the garbage. Right? But what's worse is this. Somebody tells you to do something. You know you should do it at that moment. But then you think you remember, and you do it with all your heart, and you butcher it because you didn't listen to what exactly they said. That's why we can't trust ourselves to say, look, I'll come to Jesus when I'm older. I'll come to Jesus when I have children. I'll come to Jesus when my kids are out of the house. I'll come to Jesus when I retire. I'll come to, no, today. If you hear his voice, surrender to God. Now I want us to read Hebrews chapter 8. I mean, sorry, Hebrews 4 verse 8. And then we're going to jump to Joshua, the book of Joshua. Where he says, For if Joshua had given, given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after them. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Why Joshua? First of all, we weren't talking about Joshua at all. This is a continuation of chapter 3, and we're talking about Moses. That Jesus is better than Moses. And that they didn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief, and they died in the wilderness. All that was under the jurisdiction and the leadership of Moses. Why throw Joshua in there, into the mix? Let's go to the book of Joshua, chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22. Joshua chapter 22. Verses 1 through 6. Listen to this. Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Give the no, Gadites, Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh and said to them, You have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have listened to my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days to this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers as he spoke to them. Therefore, turn now and go to your tents, to the land of your possession, which Moses, the servant of the Lord your God, the Lord gave you beyond the Jordan. Only be careful to observe the commandment and the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord God, 
commanded you to love the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments and hold fast to him and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them and sent them away and they went to their tents. Now Joshua did lead them into the promised land. Joshua did take the people where Moses did not take them. Right? Joshua is in the promised land. Joshua emphasized here that these tribes that stayed on the other side of the Jordan did help the people get the rest that they were looking for. But did they? They found physical rest. But as we know the story of Joshua and then the next book, Judges, they didn't find spiritual rest. So it's not about the location, it's about in whom are you placing your trust in. It's not about the seventh day Sabbath if you don't have Jesus in your life. You can come to church every Saturday and still be lost as can be if you don't find your rest in Jesus Christ. Look what he says in Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24. Verses 14 and 15. He had just told them they had physical rest that we read in 22, 1 through 6. Now look, now therefore, Joshua 24, 14 and 15. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself when? Today. Whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You don't make that admonition unless they're still vacillating between serving the gods of the Ammonites and the gods of Egypt. He's saying, look, I don't know about you, but as for me, today, I'm going to choose to serve God. They had entered into the promised land, but their hearts had yet to enter into the rest of Jesus Christ. Many, will, many unfortunately, will be lost serving God on the seventh day Sabbath, but have never surrendered their hearts to Jesus Christ. So I ask you today, if you hear his voice, come to Christ, then the Sabbath will have me. And this rest is not about life is going to be hunky dory and life is going to go <laughs> peacefully. The rest is knowing that even if they throw me in jail, that even if they behead me for the cause of Christ, I have rest my trust in Jesus Christ. Right? It's not the absence of suffering where we saw in Hebrews chapter 2 that, that Jesus was perfected in suffering. We read verses in Peter that we are going to suffer for the cause of Christ. So rest is not the absence of suffering. It is the, the, the foundational truth that you can do whatever you want to me. I have a home in glory that I'll shine to the sun. It is that rest that Job says, even though you slay me, in you will I trust. See, too often we think when things go bad that God has forsaken us. No, when we really have Jesus Christ, we understand that we may have to suffer for the cause of Christ. But if I'm languishing in some jail at the end of time, if I'm separated from my family, or heaven forbid have to suffer the agony that my own family betrays me, I can trust in Jesus to get me through. They were in the promised land. But he didn't, Joshua didn't want him to miss the rest that's only found in Jesus. Verse 9, back to Hebrews. 
So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains the seventh day Sabbath for the people of God. But if it's but if it's only for you that it's the right day, but you have the wrong attitude, you miss the whole point. You can have the right day in the wrong attitude and you're lost. Just as much as you can have the wrong day in the right attitude and be saved. For it's never been about promised land. It's a, always been about a promised person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter they were in the promised land. Many of them were lost. And to take the analogy full, the true promised land is what? Heaven. You may have the seventh day Sabbath here, but if you don't have the God of the Sabbath, the one who says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, then you will never enter into the true promised land in heaven. It's all about Jesus. But I can't force my relationship with Jesus on you. The only way to do it is for you to have your own relationship with Jesus. Verse 10, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. I've shared this when I was coming back to Christ. I laugh now at the stupidity of my thinking, but when I was coming back to Christ, I used, I used to say to myself, I, I give up clubbing and I'll be burned. So I gave up clubbing and then the Lord showed me something else. Oh, okay, okay. I give up that and then I'm perfect. After that happened a couple of times, I realized two things. One, it's not about my perfection. It's about his. And second, the Lord doesn't show you all your faults at once because it would overwhelm you. But I'm still growing in Christ every day. Every day, he points out things that I need to surrender. And some lessons, I have to come back around and then around and then around and then around. But I've stopped trying to do it in my own works. It's about surrendering more and more to him and his ways. To do it God's way. To base my faith in his promises, not my desires and my needs. To base my life on his word to follow his path, to follow the land wherever it may lead. Verse 11. It's an admonition to all of us. Therefore, let us diligently, let us be diligent to enter that rest. Can you enter heaven right now? The answer is no. So it can't be talking about heaven. Can you enter the promised land back in the old days? Well, I wouldn't get it. I would advise you to go to Palestine and those areas in war right now. So we see it's never been about physical promised land or even the promised land in heaven. Because you're not going to get to heaven unless you rest in Jesus Christ today. If you trust him today with your kids, with your bills, with your retirement, with your education, with your future spouse, with your future children, with whatever tribulation and trial you may face, you need to trust him today. Today, when you hear his voice. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Will there be any disobedience once we're in heaven? No. no. Iniquity will not rise a second time. Only the righteous will make it to heaven. Sealed by the sealing of the Holy Spirit forever. So it can't be talking just about heaven. If you can fall away from it, if you're not diligent about it, that means it is happening today. There's only two choices you're making in your life today. We're either getting closer to God or we're getting further away from God. And how do we help ourselves? We can't be listening to a sermon seven days a week. We have to work. We can't 
be on the internet listening to something. We have to go to school. We have to do our work. We have to be faithful workers. We can't divide our time. Verse 12 tells us, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of your heart. You want to know where you are with Christ? Read the word of God. Soak it in. Let it do its perfect surgery in your heart. And there you will be revealed what is your Moses in your life if you have one. What is taking the place of Jesus in your life? Read the word of God. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It will not lie to you. It will not sugarcoat it. It will tell you directly what you need. And that answer will always be, Surrender to Jesus Christ. That's why many people don't read the Word of God. Because they want to follow plan A and God is telling them, nope, it's plan B. They want to open the safe for $5 billion and God is saying, it's over here. And obviously, you know I'm not talking about $5 billion. I'm talking about something richer than $5 billion. I'm talking about eternity with Jesus Christ. They want to do it their way. But God is saying, no, it has to be my way. And the only way you're going to know that for yourself, not at the beckoning of a spouse or children, is by you to get into the living word and let the surgeon do his work. Verse 13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. He's not going to lie to you. He's going to tell it to you straight. He's going to give you the solution. And that solution is that he died for you and for me. And that he loved you so much that he gave his only life for you to be saved. That's why those of us who have found the rest will conclude in these last three verses. It says, Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He knows every dark secret in my life. He knows every mess up, every bad thought I've ever had and continue to have. He knows every place I can fall short. And I yet have come through the grace of God, knowing that he knows every secret, knowing that he knows every bad thing I've done, every bad thought I've had. I've come to the point of realizing, like the song says, you know the depths of my heart. And you love me the same. I worship an awesome God. He knows you. Don't hide anything from him. He knows what you do when you're alone. He knows what you think about when that person irritates you. He knows your plans. He knows where you have told him, no, I want to pursue this degree or this spouse or this job or this career. He knows it all. And yet he still loves you the same. So he invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace. Surrender all your desires to him. And you know what you'll find? Is that you don't have to give up a lot of your desires. A lot of them in Christ will be noble. And he can use them for his kingdom and his glory and honor. Paul wanted nothing but to preach the truth of God. And he surrendered all of that to God. And guess what God did? Give him the very thing he wanted to do. But now he was doing it for the glory and honor of God. Moses wanted nothing but to take the people of Israel into the promised land. But he had to surrender the earthly promised land. And he accepted that 
Even though you read Deuteronomy chapter 4, four times he prayed, or chapter 3, he prayed, Lord, please let me lead them in. So much so that God had to tell him enough. Don't ask anymore. But what did God do? He allowed Moses to open the gates for Jesus, the true Israelite, into the true promised land. But you have to take whatever you love the most, whether it's a child, a spouse, a job, and say, Lord, I love you more. And today, I will surrender that to you. And you could only do that at the throne of grace. So here's my appeal. If, you can, if, if any of this message resonated with you today, then don't put off surrendering to Jesus to tomorrow. Tomorrow, you may not hear the voice of God. But as for me and my house, we've been through a lot. I've been through a lot. And I still find my rest in Jesus Christ. For he will never leave me nor forsake me. And that true promised land where I will find physical rest is guaranteed to me today because of Jesus. I pray that you make the decision today to hunger after him, to get into his word and let that sharp to its sword show you what is your Moses that you need to let go and surrender to Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. Many people are in the valley of decision, even within the church. They may be kidding themselves that they're going in the right direction, but perhaps they're going in the wrong. So, Father, I pray that every family here will be in the true promised land, but it starts today. Father, help us to surrender to you daily. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. You know, Deborah mentioned this in her prayer. It's political season. And many people are wondering, should I vote for Republican or Democrat? You vote however you want. But remember, your only rest is in Jesus Christ. Amen. He's in control of everything. He is the one that will bring us salvation. Not a Republican, not a Democrat. You want true rest during this political season? Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that no matter what we face, the only rest we can find is in a personal, faith-saving relationship with you. We thank you and we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.